How We Think by J.J. Van der Leeuw, read by Dave Marsland of Cardiff Theosophical Society. How We Think What happens when we think? Thinking seems to be an activity in which all of us are engaged at least part of the day. Every now and then we have to think over some problem or decide whether to do a thing or not. And yet, if we were asked, what do we do when we thus think out a problem, we should find it very hard to give an answer. We know vaguely that something happens inside and that when someone else is thinking, we see him make a very solemn face and sit with puckered forehead. But that is about all we know about the workings of thought. What really happens inside is the problem and it is very difficult to analyse, for the moment we think to watch for how we think, we stop thinking. We either think and do not watch what happens, or else we watch and do not think. The difficulty is to split our consciousness so that we can think with one part and watch what we are doing with the other. It is not an easy thing to learn, but once we are able to do it, the results are quite interesting, if not always flattering. The first thing we discover is that most of what we call thinking is not quite such an important and solemn work as we would make ourselves believe, and a better name for it would be daydreaming. When, for instance, we find ourselves in a tram, or on a ferry boat, or sitting in a room, and are, as we call it, lost in thought, we are, in reality, only daydreaming. When we watch what we are doing under such circumstances, we find that we generally build up images of ourselves in different situations and then start living and acting in those images. We hold imaginary discussions with the other dramatis personae in our little picture and behave in different ways with regard to them. It is quite an interesting process in its way we are using the creative or image-making faculty of thought and by its means create an entire situation in which we behave in an heroic or cowardly manner as our mood of the moment may dictate. Then we suddenly wake up with a start to find ourselves sitting in a tram or reading a book of which all that time we were quite oblivious. If we are asked what we were doing we say that we were thinking but it would be truer to say that we were dreaming. Yet we must not undervalue these daydreams, because in them the current desires of our daily life are vitalised by the creative power of the imagination and set up living thought forms in ourselves, which sooner or later take effect in our daily behaviour. By the nature of our daydreaming, we determine largely what we are to be, and that is why it is a power which we should learn to control and use for the better instead of for the worse, but we can hardly call it thinking. Let us analyse another process of thought. For instance, the solution of a scientific problem or a problem of daily life. Now, how do we set about it? First, we look at the problem and state it to ourselves mentally, generally in words. These words are, of course, not pronounced physically, but are, as it were, said in thought. And when we watch them, we find that they are only partially pronounced and form only fragmentary sentences. We take a good deal for granted in this inner conversation with ourselves. Having stated the problem, we take some particular aspect of it and, as we call it, concentrate on that which really means that for a moment we exclude other subjects from our minds. Then we watch the reactions and associations which it causes in our consciousness. And if it is a scientific problem, we watch whether these ramifications throw any light on the subject in question. And so, step after step, we work out our problem. Very often, the solution does not come straight away, and we have to abandon the problem for the moment. 
Yet the activity thus set up is not entirely stopped. The problem, as it were, simmers on quietly, even though we may not be conscious of it, and according to the intensity of our original statement of it, as also the intensity of our desire to find a solution, a corresponding activity may be set up in the higher mind. Then, very often months or even years later, generally when we are not thinking about the subject at all, we suddenly know the solution. The thing is present in our mind. It is thus, when the intellect is quiet and not specially concentrated on anything in particular, when we are in our bath or eating our breakfast perhaps, that the higher mind, our true mind, has a chance to make itself heard on any subject. We say that a solution has suddenly struck us, and so it has, only it is not, as we often think, produced by the intellect. It is the intuitive knowledge of the higher mind which flashes into the workings of the intellect. Sometimes this happens while we are pondering over the problem, but more often while the intellect is at rest. Thus the greatest scientific discoveries or philosophical conclusions often appear while the intellect itself is disengaged. The waters of the intellect must be perfectly smooth if something of the higher mind is to be reflected therein.